Tonight's episode of Legacy Battle is brought to you by Atlas Benefits. Atlas Benefits has solutions for your insurance needs. Atlas Benefits can help you obtain Medicare, health, or life insurance, and employee benefits. You can find them on the web at www.atlasbenefits.com. Or you can contact Rob Ducey or Roy Smith at 727-600-2892 and mention Legacy Battle Podcast. Atlas Benefits has all the solutions for your insurance needs. Enjoy the show. This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit subscribe, whatever you're listening on to YouTube, iHeartRadio, Apple, Spotify, Podnod, Safari, Bing, Google Chrome. We're on it all. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King, Ball State Athletics, Paul Habakot, uh, Stephen King, who happens to be Brian King's brother, but not the real Stephen King writer that everyone's probably thinking right now. He is Legacy Battle's own film specialist, so we have him joining us here tonight. Our special guest. We're joined by a comedian, writer, actor, who I'm sure y'all recognize just by looking at the screen right now. You've seen him in TV shows like King of Queens, Comics Unleashed, and Fargo, movies such as Paul Plart, um, I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry. Here comes the boom, which we're going to discuss later on tonight as well. Um, he, and he's George Bannister in the Dog Who Saved movie series. Quite a few of those out there. I, I've seen a few of them myself. My daughter loves them. And he's got a new movie coming out on Netflix home team. We're going to discuss that here a little bit later after the debate. So we're joined by actor Gary Valentine. Hi guys. All right. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate you being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. So tonight's debate, we're going to be debating the greatest sports film in the other category. Um, so basically sports that don't fall into the main four there. Um, and after, as always, we'll have our Q&A with Gary. So let's jump right in. We're going to start with Kingpin. Okay, yeah, Kingpin released in '96 with a budget of 25 million. End up grossing in the theaters 32.2 million. Fairly Brothers picture, and you're really getting into a probably a far too little covered sport of bowling. And, and when you see this, you're seeing athleticism here at its, at its finest. You've got Randy Quaid kind of playing a young phenom uh, Amish bowler. He's bowling for fun, uh, and uh, you got Woody Harrelson playing Roy Mudson. Got Bill, the great Bill Murray playing Ernie McCracken, and Vanessa Angel's in this. Kind of ends up turning into Roy's love interest um, <clears throat> as they're kind of touring the country, uh, conning people. So it's filmed in around various areas of Pittsburgh because Roy's lived in Scranton for a while, and then I think it ends in in the Reno, Nevada area. And Roy is an ex-professional uh, alcoholic bowler who sort of su suffered some tragedy in his life. He he started out strong, and it's a movie that. You're going through a lot of twists and turns because you're, it's starting out, it's him and his father. His father's giving him some advice. You can tell he's got um, skills with bowling, and he's bowling in a dirt patch behind his dad's mechanic shop, and he's, he's, he's knocking down strikes. Um, and so his dad's giving him some advice, and he ends up winning the 1979 Iowa State Bowling Championship, which ends up causing him to leave home and go pro. I, th I think if I recall, he won $1,500, you know, on that big check that they give him. But uh, – he gets kind of into the wrong crowd there with uh, Ernie McCracken, and he, he loses the one thing a bowler can't, which is his hand. So he, he's in the wrong crowd there, and he's, he's kind of at rock bottom. He's, he's working in uh, Scranton as a, as a traveling bowling supply salesman. He gets into some uh, hard times, you know, with his landlady, uh, no pun intended, because you can't, uh, you know, he couldn't pay the rent. So he's, he's selling, he's peddling lane oil. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants anything to do with him. And he comes across uh, Randy Quaid and uh, he's playing Ishmael who's, who's bowling and they, he right away sees he could maybe make some money, turn his life around. So, you know, the remainder of the movie is sort of him 
pulling sort of the same scams that Ernie and him pulled to make money off this Ishmael character. And, uh, it, you know, it holds up. The movie holds up. I think Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 50%. It's worth it wow, for uh, at least uh, 50% of your attention as you watch it. You get to see some good tension between uh, Woody Harrelson and, and Angel. And uh, it's got everything a good comedy ha- you know, needs, a gambling addiction, alcoholism, you know, basically uh, key ingredients to, to a great comedy. But uh, Bill Murray probably steals a, a lot of the show. He's very unlikable. You don't really get a lot of closure. I won't spoil it. But you don't really get a lot of closure with that unlikable character. And really, I had to go back and rewatch it because it had been a while. I really had trouble getting behind any of the characters. They're all pretty much unlikable. But uh, still holds up. Not a, not a huge budget movie, but uh, one worth watching. There is a sequel coming. Um, I read that they have signed on to do a sequel. So that should be coming soon. Uh, Gary, let me ask you, the Farrelly brothers, comic geniuses, I mean, just some of their films, Dumb and Dumber, Something About Mary, Shallow Hal. I mean, what are your thoughts on them uh, and, and their comic genius, but also uh, the movie Kingpin? Well, you left out Stuck on You, the one I was in. That's right, Stuck <laughs> on You, yeah. With uh, Kinnear and uh, Matt Damon. That's right. Uh, they play conjoined twins. Yeah, it didn't uh, do too well, but it was really a fun movie to make. Look, the Farrelly brothers are great. They're, they're friends of mine now. Uh, I love them. We golf together. Um, they're just, I, I just love their comedy, their spirit. And they have the best soundtracks too, by the way, musically. Um, but Kingpin was great. I mean, just the subtleties, like when he's bending his rubber fingers back and it, the little squeaks <laughs> that are going on. <laughs> I mean, just stupid little stuff like that I love. Um yeah, it was great. I think uh, you're right. All the characters are pretty unlikable. Ishmael's kind of likable, I would say. But the other ones are uh, not so likable. But it does work. It holds up. And it was done, what, 27, 8 years ago now? 96. Um, Ishmael becomes really likable when he goes to the freezer. Do you remember that scene? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> he gets a beer out of the freezer. <laughs> yeah, I won't yeah. give it away, but that, he, he becomes real likable there. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I thought it was, I think it's one of the best movies, uh, for, for, like you said, a sport that we don't talk about a lot and an alcoholic bowler. I feel like aren't all bowlers alcoholics. <laughs> I mean, that's why you go bowling because you cheap pitches of beer. You know, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> don't be a Munson. <laughs> Important information there. All right, let's move on to our second film. That's here comes the boom. All right, here comes the boom. Come out in uh, 2012. Uh, $73.1 million box office. A uh, very solid cast here. Um, you got Kevin James, Henry Winkler, Salma Hayek, uh, Bass Rutan, and uh, uh, Chris, Christoph uh, Sosinski. Hopefully I got the name right. Both UFC fighters. Uh, Joe Rogan and, of course, Gary Valentine. Um, Kevin James, he plays Scott Boss. Biology, biology teacher, and he's kind of in a rut in his life. Um, he attends a faculty meeting, and he learns that the music program uh, will be getting cut from the school curriculum. So this just devastates um, uh, Marty, who's played by Henry Winkler, uh, who has just completely devoted his life to his love of music. Uh, so uh, both to help his good friend Marty and to you know try and impress uh, uh, Belle Flores, mm-hmm. Um, who is played by the beautiful Salma Hayek, um, you know, uh, he decides that he's going to try to see what he can do to save the music program. Um, so uh, he needs to get $48,000 uh, in order to, to save the program. So he hooks up with USC fighter Boss Rutan and former kickboxer uh, Mark De- uh, Della Grotte to train for the MMA. And this is how he's gonna make his money. This is his scheme. He's gonna go in there. He doesn't care if he loses. He just has to go in there, get the prize money, hook him up and save the day. So, and, and Marty's there for support in his corner as well. Well, Scott Foss, he hilariously loses more matches than he wins. Um, his, his, uh, uh, his story eventually it, uh, catches the attention of Joe Rogan. 
And Rogan invites him to compete in a UFC bout in Las Vegas versus the champion, Ken Dietrich, who's played by Christoph uh, Sosinski. Um, even a loss would give them enough money to save the music program. But wait, it's discovered that the school's accountant has been embezzling money, and now Scott Voss needs to score a win to save the day. So I really genuinely like this movie. Um, so did my wife. Believe me, she's a big critic. Um, but it's very funny. I loved all the Kevin James in-ring blunders. I mean, you know, who doesn't love just you know, laughing at the fat guy getting beat up? Um, Gary, Gary Valentine scenes as Eric Voss, hilarious. I got to say, if I talked to my wife that way, I'd be sleeping on the couch. Uh, <laughs> um, and a bit of a romance and, you know, an, an underdog story. So it's kind of gotten a lot of cool ingredients to be a, a good movie, a feel-good movie, and a comedy as well. So, Gary, this was your film. You were in it. I, I've heard it was based off a true story. Is that accurate? And your brother, Kevin James, that's the best shape I've ever seen him in in, in the movies I've seen him in. I mean, did he go through some regiment to get there? And you you honestly had all the funny lines in the movie. So tell us about the film. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it's got a really good message, too, throughout. You know, uh, the family, how, the, how everyone's a family in this fight club. And... Um, it's funny, all these movies are the same, right? They got to raise money, so they come up with a scheme to do something. You know, Kingpin, same thing. Um, but the, the premise is the same, but it, it was really great. Yeah, and Kev got in crazy shape. I mean, he was really fighting with these UFC fighters. They were beating the hell out of him, really. And uh, he was drinking, like, green drinks the whole time, and that was about it. But, um, yeah, it was fun. You know, uh, Melissa Peterman, who played my wife, She's fantastic, you know. We did another project with her, Dusty Peacock, where she played my girlfriend. We just love using her, and she's great. And we improvised a lot of those lines where we're going back and forth, you know, um, in the basement. But, yeah, it was fun, you know. It was uh, a great movie. Didn't didn't do great, and I think it was because of the poster. Like, I, I don't think um, Sony had the right idea of what it was. It was like kind of Kev laying down as a school teacher. And it was just his head, and it's like, what is this about? You know, I think it should have been more of a, uh, maybe a back back shadow of a guy, like, you know, with school books or something, you know. I, I don't think people understood what it was going to be. and uh, But I think people enjoy it. I think they enjoy it now, uh, watching it on uh, Netflix and whatnot, you know. 71 million is a pretty good take. I mean, that's, yeah. it's not too bad. So, all right, let's move on to uh, our next film. That's going to be Basketball. Uh, yeah, so I highly enjoyed this movie. I'm a huge Trey Parker and Matt Stone fan, regardless, almost everything that they do. Um, this was the second live action movie that they did. Uh, the first um, was more of an indie film being Orgasmo. <laughs> and I won't get into that movie too much. Um, but it was kind of amazing that they got the cast and the funding and everything that they did. Um, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, you know, 47% or 42%. Critics, 74% audience score. Once again, proving that the critics are wrong. <laughs> uh, it was a great movie. Um, you know, some of the things I personally liked about it, I, I love they had Real Big Fish in it as the sport band, which I think would be way cooler, you know, like the Tonight Show band playing during the breaks during the sport. Um, I was amazed on all the different people they got involved to do it. Uh, you know, basically the story was two slackers from high school who never amounted to anything, went to a party with everyone who did, uh, and they invent a game, you know, in the driveway. It involves basketball with baseball rules, almost like course, uh, with a lot of other different elements involved. Um, one of the things that I, I really loved was the psych out element that they had in this, which was trying to mess with your opponent when they're trying to make the shot, um, which is kind of one of those schoolyard things. Uh, but now, as you see people like, uh, you know, Conor McGregor or the Paul brothers, and it's kind of become part of sports to, you know, mess with your opponent in that way. Uh, the amount of famous people they had in this movie was was crazy. The announcers were Bob Costas, Al Michaels, Kirk Gowdy, Jim Blampley. Um, Robert Vaughn was the bad guy. Uh, basically, uh, he comes in and try, tries to buy out the team uh, that Coop and, uh, and Matt Stone's character started and get the money back into the sport, which is kind of the, you know, the original idea and why they wanted to do the sport. And Ernest Borgnine was involved was because there was no money and uh, 
and they wanted to keep the purity of the sport going. Uh, once again, Ernest Borgnine was in it. He's an Oscar winning actor and is in 211 film projects, but this is the only one where he sings I'm Too Sexy in a posthumous funeral video, which was awesome. <laughs> uh, they had the Robert Stack Unsolved Mystery sequence, which was really, really cool. Uh, Dale Earnhardt was their taxi driver at one point in time. And Reggie Jackson, who's kind of the focus and inspiration uh, to Coop in the film, shows up at the end. Um, I really love this movie. Uh, I love the fact that everybody can play. Um, I love when they got wasted before the big game. Uh, Reminded me of like Doc Ellis or Wade Boggs type of story. Um, I love it starting in the driveway, just like, you know, basketball kind of started uh, in a YMCA or, you know, some of these sports started hockey out on the pond. Um, So, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I think that it was an awesome live action effort. And I definitely think it was probably their best effort that they've done as far as a live action movie is concerned. And uh, I think all around, it didn't take itself too seriously, and it was a fun film. All these movies got that that one beautiful woman in it. Yours uh, basically had Yasmin Bleeth just absolutely Yeah, gorgeous. Yasmin Bleeth was, yeah, which would never be a Trey Parker in real life. Jenny McCarthy, yeah. too. Jan, oh, yeah, Jenny yeah, McCarthy, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. There's so many famous people in basketball. It, it's, it's nuts. It was really, really an enjoyable film. So, Gary, the, the creators of this movie – They've done South Park for 25 plus years now. They know their audience. They know what's going to sell. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on this film? I mean, they really had to make up this sport just to have this film. Yeah, no, no doubt. You know, I've been more of a, a like a Family Guy fan. I think it's either one way or the other. South Park didn't really do it for me, but I didn't get, I didn't get into it enough. I think I, I didn't watch enough of it to really link on to these guys, but man, I'll tell you what, they went for it in this movie. They did just about every, every you know, crazy goofball thing. But I give them credit for the creativity of combining baseball with basketball because, look, we all, most of us don't want to really run. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And if you can play Everybody the sport, can play the sport, yeah. Yeah, if you can play the sport of baseball and basketball without really running, you know, they would pace the base, but still. Uh, yeah, it was a cool idea. It was, I, I bet you it, it came from horse, you know? Uh, yeah. and like you said, the, the, um, kind of like the, uh, the, the drawing that you, you're able to give your buddy, like sometimes we do it on the golf course, you know, before he makes a shot, you know, you make the rule up, all right, you can do anything, but you can't touch them, you know? Uh, so it was cool. And yeah, they did have a lot, a lot of famous people. My gosh. And, yeah. and all these sports and the movies that we're talking about today, other than Brian's, you don't have to be in great shape for. So that's that's my kind of sport. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was really but, enjoyable rewatching the film. Uh, my girlfriend's from England, and she had never seen it, and she's not that familiar with baseball or basketball. So it was kind of hilarious to watch her reaction to things, you know. And then at one point in time, she said, the announcers are really, really good. I was like, that's because it's Bob Costas and Al Michaels. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> they do, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure they were reading all their lines, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's move on to our final film tonight. That's going to be represented by me. It is Dodgeball, a true underdog story. Now, depending on what country you live, would depend on the title of that uh, movie. Um, it was called just Dodgeball. It was called Dodgeball, true underdog story. And it had one other title as well that I, I'm forgetting what it is now. But uh, so 2004, $20 million budget made $168.4 million at the box office. Starring the comic genius of Ben Stiller, uh, Rip Torn's in it, Vince Vaughn, and Stiller's wife, uh, Christine Taylor, who was probably most famous for playing uh, Jan Brady. No, not Jan Brady. Marsha Brady Marcia on the, Brady. The, yeah. the Brady Bunch films. Um, so that's that's the beautiful woman from this film is, is uh, Miss Taylor there. Nominated for an SB, a BMI award, and three MTV Movie Awards with Stiller winning for the best villain. Uh, his villain was just absolutely classic in this film. Um, quick synopsis, Vince Vaughn plays Peter LaFleur, who owns the Average Joe's Gym. It's in default. The bank's going to take it back with um, basically he needs $50,000. What an ironic amount. He needs $50,000. Mm-hmm. Then you got White Goodman, who owns Globo Gym next door. He wants to buy it so he can turn it into a, a, a parking lot for his people. Um, long story short, uh, to get the money, the average shows Jim, led by Peter Floor, joins a, ju- a dodgeball tournament. They only qualify because the the kids' Girl Scouts team they lose to one of the players got busted for steroids and like beaver tranquilizer or something crazy <laughs> like that. So 
So they make it to the, the, the finals of this big tournament in Las Vegas. And of course they're playing Globo Jim led by uh, Ben Stiller's character, Good, uh, White Goodman. Um, the, tor- the tournament's aired on ESPN, the Ocho. So that was the first uh, appearance of the Ocho, which now ESPN does that every once in a while. They'll put these rare obscure sports on it called ESPN, the Ocho. Um, just some funny mo- m- moments in it. Um, David Hasselhoff scolding the German team after they lose <laughs> was pretty <laughs> funny. Um, White uh, Goodman and his his muscle man sidekick when they're they're riding on a scooter together that was pretty funny. Um, Patches a hole of hand, you know he buy uh, he, he's the coach of average shows and he teaches them by throwing wrenches at them how to dodge and throws them in the middle of traffic. You got dodge you can dodge a car you can dodge a ball. Um, and then White Goodman's 80s feather haircut was pretty classic. And his pump-up jock, if you remember the pump-up shoes, he's got the pump-up jock. <laughs> and uh, and his, his attempts to woo Kate were, were all funny as well. Um, so there's two things I want to ask you about this film, Gary. Um, the first is the original ending of this movie, Average Joe's loses and Global Jim takes over, but Steve the Pirate finds his booty the treasure and buys the gym back and it didn't test well what do, what do you think if that would have been the ending uh yeah i kind of like the way it ended this way me too yeah. f and chuck yeah. Norris. <laughs> that would have been a little uh goofy really goofy to you know all of a sudden he finds this you know chest of uh, all the money right. um yeah, it's great. And, you know, Ben Still is great. I love everything Vince Vaughn does. And it was like the straightest he's ever been, Vince Vaughn. Like, he was, he really played the straight guy. I mean, it wasn't right. a lot of comedy for him, you know? Right. Uh, yeah, he so, usually plays that run on talking character, you know, which is great. But, uh, yeah, I love it. Love the feathered hair. Anytime you got wigs working, you know, it's great. So now when the ending changed on the movie, that's when they added in that overtime and the, and the Chuck Norris scene sends them into overtime where. All players have to remain in the triangle to uh, throw the ball. If they step out of the triangle, they're disqualified. So I want to show you this picture behind me. Give me one second. That is Peter LaFleur, who won by hit, hitting West Goodman with the ball. Or West Goodman with the ball. He stepped out of the triangle. He should have been disqualified. Globo Jim <laughs> should have won the tournament. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you can go there. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you caught this, though, at the end when they're all walking away, uh, average Joes, Vince Vaughn goes to put his arm around uh, somebody, and he punches Christine Taylor right in the face, and they kept it in. It's the funniest no, thing. Literally, it. like a, you know, she was on this side, and he was going like this, and he goes, boom, and she goes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. I'm going to have to check that out now. Awesome. awesome. I, don't, I don't know how I caught it, but uh, yeah, I caught it. But yeah, go on YouTube, check out the 30 for 30 dodgeball. You'll see yep. the whole the whole little thing about that, him stepping out of the triangle. So, all right, so we got our four films tonight. Let's move into our vote. Paul, you're in my upper corner. Can't take your own film, guys. All right, it's close, but um, isn't dodgeball the one where Ben Stiller says, nobody makes me bleed my own blood? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 One, right? yeah. <laughs> I, I have yep. to go with that one. I, I agree with Gary. Like it was it was kind of the straightest we'd seen Vince and it's got so many quotable lines and uh that, that movie's really funny. All right. Brian. I mean for me, you know, here here comes the boom as the best message. Uh, I mean Dodgeball was the most successful. Kingpin's my favorite, but I gotta go basketball. I mean, it was just the best overall. All that, all that star power, all that, just they just put so much into it. So I got to go with that one. Steven. Um, I got to say, here comes the boom. And, and, I, and I kind of agree with Gary that it was a little bit of a sleeper movie. And when I first watched it, you know, it was like, I think it was on DVD at the time. It was something I picked up and it blew me away. Uh, and I loved seeing Boss Rutten in that comedic role, just kind of being himself. I mean, he carries those scenes so well. And he, he's not really an actor. It's just how he is. And seeing, you know, him and Kevin James play off each other. And, and it was really, for Kevin James, was the really first serious thing I ever saw him do, where he put some passion in it. And it was just all for the kids so that they could play music and to help out. It wasn't, you know, for him. I mean, part of it was, you know, obviously Selma Hayek. But, you know, he was trying to, you know, help out the school and help out the kids, you know, love of music and to keep things going. And, and like you said, Gary, that 
camaraderie feeling. So I really have to go with Here Comes the Boom. So in 70 episodes, we have over 70 now. This has only happened twice. I'm taking Kingpin. And, and the reason why I'm taking <laughs> Kingpin is I believe that, one, the Farrelly brothers are just fantastic. But I think Dodgeball is the funniest movie, and we are in the comedy genre tonight. I can't vote for my own, obviously. Uh, but I think Kingpin was the next funniest. Um, Paul mentioned the Dennis Quaid scene with the freezer. And, and, and I got to mention right before that, Miss Angel did it. And, and it was a lot, <laughs> a lot better, of course. Um, <laughs> I, I, the rubber hand, the, the, what he does to keep his apartment. I mean, that whole movie is just hilarious. And if you, if you fast forward through the credits of that movie, there's that lady who was his um, landlord. For like five minutes straight, just going like this. Ah, <laughs> the credits. So I'm taking Kingpin. So Gary, we come to you. You can vote for your own film. You can vote for any of them. Which one are you taking tonight? Well, of course, I love Here Comes the Boom, but I got to go with Kingpin myself. <clears throat> it's just classic. It's just, uh, it holds up. Um, I love the, the actors playing it straight and... You know, that and the funny lines, which makes it funny. Uh, you know, it's it's a little silly, but it's not over the top. And, um, you know, how many movies about bowling and the Amish do we see? <laughs> exactly. Talk about tough topics to cover. <laughs> yeah. So I don't think the Amish see any movies. <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul, you got the win. You get first question in our Q&A tonight. <clears throat> Yeah, Gary, I got one of the things that brings me great joy is the Coen brothers. I've enjoyed watching the seasons of Fargo as they've rolled them out. And you were on, I think you were on the first season, right? Was it I was. With, um, Billy Bob Thornton? And you were, was it Officer Nudson you played? Is that how you pronounce that name? Yeah, uh, De Deputy Nudson, yeah. Nudson, yeah. I didn't know if it was Nudson or Nudson, but uh, what, how'd you get involved with that? And, as you work with them, what's so special? Why do they make such really good, well thought out, put together uh, show? I mean, they're just each episode was like a miniature movie. How how was that for you? It was fantastic. Uh, I actually didn't. They weren't really involved too much um, with it. They had other producers and writers that stepped in, but they were kind of schooling them on you know where to take it. Uh, it's an interesting story, pretty crazy. I auditioned for Bob Odenkirk's part, the uh, the uh, sheriff, and I didn't get it. And I'm walking on stage at the DC Improv one night to do stand-up, and my phone rings, and it's my agent. They said, they want to see you for Fargo. I said, what are you talking about? It was two months ago. I didn't... Well, they ended up writing the part for me, which was amazing. I mean, that never happens, you know? Um, didn't, it never happened to me, anyway. So they wrote the specific part. Uh, I played the deputy. I think I was in six of ten episodes, and uh, a lot of fun, man. Billy Bob was amazing. Uh, they were just just a great cast, and just and Odenkirk and I just had a blast doing doing this thing. For me, it was I've never done a dark comedy like that, you know, uh, playing it straight again, and um, just how wild this world is in Fargo. I mean, it's crazy. Um, these people, this small town feel, and really a lot of fun. We shot it in Calgary, um, so it was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, we did that. Uh, I was in the first season. I, I don't forget what year it was, 2013 or 14? Yeah, yeah it, was it was, I think, 2014. And you talk about good music. They got really good music throughout the, the kind of the themes of each of those episodes. You know, it's a lot of it's instrumental, but, man, it was, it was really good. Great soundtrack, yeah. Cool. Brian, I, I saw that you were uh, one time a special guest on the MLB Network. I mean, this is a sports uh, podcast, so I wanted to ask you. I, I think you said you're a Mets fan, right? So, yep. so that's your team. Um, and so, who are your favorite players? You know, have you always been a fan since uh, you started growing up? Or I got um, on a loop. I got on a loop in my house. MLB. Oh nice. wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, grew up on Long Island, um, Met fan the whole way, and um, really exciting now because we have the richest owner in baseball. We have our George Steinbrenner, finally, that's spending money like crazy and bringing in some great talent. So it's going to be a really interesting season. Hopefully we 
get it off on time with everything that's going on with the meetings. But um, yeah, I, uh, I I love baseball. That's my sport. I grew up playing it. I played college ball. Um, I would have to say baseball and golf are my two favorite sports, and then probably football. And I played uh, a little hockey too in high school. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Can I answer your question? I don't even know if I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Golf, yeah, I was. Yeah. I went on MLB um, actually a few times. It was really cool. Uh, I was on MLB Now with Brian Kenny, uh, and they have a few uh, reporters and players that come in. You just talk baseball, and I, I love it. I could talk baseball forever. So, really, a lot of fun. Stephen. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Valentine, Gary. Uh, I have a question for you about uh, now pronouncing Chuck and Larry, which actually, incidentally, was. First movie that me and my kid's mom went out on a date on 2007. So uh, I remember it vividly. I remember seeing the movie. Um, um, it's kind of a two-part question. One, uh, did you get a chance to work with the, the actual fire department in New York City um, for those scenes? And two, um, just kind of the subject matter of the film, you know, being gay marriage, was there any kind of pushback at that time about it? Or was just kind of people saw it as a comedy film and were, uh, and were happy about it? Uh, well, your first question, we didn't work with the uh, New York Fire Department. We worked with the L.A. Fire Department because we okay. shot most of it shot in L.A. LA. And we trained with these uh, firefighters. It's crazy. It's 75 pounds of gear. And we were, like, tired. We weren't even putting out fires. We're, like, standing around getting tired. But um, we did put out a few fires. Like, we did shoot one scene in the Bronx. And... Um, where the, they lit the building on fire and we went in and closed that up, but uh, put the fire out. But um, yeah, really, really cool working with these firefighters and really a cool. lot of respect for what they do, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, and then the, the, the homosexual thing. Yeah. There was some pushback even back in 07, you know, uh, I remember Adam and Kevin were, you know, um, talking about it and it, they, it, it was not to make fun of anybody. It was just to, you know, it's a comedy. It, you know, they thought it was, uh, I guess when Adam and his guys wrote it, they wanted to tackle that topic. And, and you got, uh, it, they did a great job of it, really. It was, they did a good job of being both funny and, and not offensive. And the, the jokes were great. Yeah, like exactly. Ben Rain's character, you know, yeah, was, was, was awesome. Yeah. Because yeah, you always see him as the tough guy as Marcellus Wallace, you know, and then to see him in that kind of a role, was really empowering. Working with Dan Aykroyd, I mean, that had to be awesome, you know? Uh, he was great, yeah. The stories and stuff, really, really neat when you get to work with these old-time actors, you know? Like, uh, when we did The King of Queens with Jerry Stiller, we, he, I mean, he had millions of stories of the old days, and, you know, um, it was just amazing. Gavin McLeod played my dad, and he was on Mary Tyler Moore, and, you know, Love Boat, and all his shows way back when, and just all the stories they had, crazy. So you, you started as a stand-up comedian. Um, you always hear stories about, like, how hard it is starting out as a comedian. You know, there's not a lot of money. Um, sometimes, like, hecklers can ruin sets. Bad audiences can make things not go well also. I mean, how was that experience for you? Um, when I started, I was in New York, uh, not the city, out on Long Island, and Back in, I started in 1988, so I don't even know if you guys were born, but. Um, <laughs> well before that, a 70s. <laughs> uh, so I, when I started, every restaurant pulled out a table in the corner and did a comedy night. Literally, every place we went in the tri-state area always had a comedy night. And then there were the comedy clubs that were pretty big. The, the comedy boom was kind of in the 80s, and I, I kind of just got in right at the edge, and then, you know, the boat pulled away from the dock, I feel like, you know. Uh, but I just, when I started, there was a lot of that going on, a lot of time that, to get stage time. Uh, so it was pretty cool for me. I, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I did it the first time, and I was hooked. Uh, hecklers, I loved it because I love improvising, and I love going back and forth with the audience. I even use the audience in my shows to this day, uh, just part of my act. Um, so it it was difficult in the fact that, uh, you know, hard to come up with material. And back then you could do and say anything, you know, now it's kind of difficult. The comedy world has really taken a hit 
because, you know, everyone gets offended so easy. Uh, and even though I work clean, still content wise, sometimes you cross the line and it's like, you know, oh, you know, but look, I love doing stand up. It's the bread and butter. I, I just love it because you're the actor, the writer, the producer, the director of your own thing, you know, so it's kind of neat. But um, yeah, it's tough. Anytime anybody asks me how to get into stand up, I just say, you just got to get on stage. Just got to do it. You know? Right. Paul. Oh. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you said that. That's kind of my last question for you is you did stand up. I can't think of a lot of things that are more brave than being up there alone, you know, and, and being vulnerable to fail. But in your opinion, because you've, you've probably worked with a lot, I feel like you have to have like a dark, there's got to be something dark with you to be a good comedian, good stand-up comedian. There's got to be some inner turmoil. You're battling something. You have a very jaded prism. Now, I know it's not 100% because I think about like Jay Leno. He did some stand-up. He's not a very dark person. He was a quality stand-up. But do you, you know, in your dealings with various comedians and the ones that have been successful, Louis C.K. comes to mind. Do you think that's kind of a must to be just a dark person battling some, some things that are going on? <laughs> You know, it, it could be that. Uh, I had a really good childhood growing up. I, it was more for me about making people laugh. Like, my family was always laughing at the dinner table and whatever. My parents were pretty funny. My dad was really dry. My, my mom was kind of silly. Uh, but, yeah, there is a, there is a, a dark side. Comedians see the world differently. We just do. We just – it's just built in us. Uh, you know, we can make fun of a funeral you know, uh, in the right way. I mean, uh, there's, we just see the, the joke in everything. And I think for myself, I don't take life too seriously. So I think that's where I get my stuff from. Uh, my act is a bit silly and, um, you know, just it, it's about my life and how I view things. And, but yeah, there are guys out there. I mean, Seinfeld is not a jaded person per se, you know, there's a lot of guys that are that work cleaner and and with the content and stuff, um, but yeah, there's definitely something wrong with comedians. <laughs> I'll say that kind of very personal, kind of to his point, Mike. I mean, it, it really comes, you know, like the division between style and just you know writing, tight writing. Well, Seinfeld is a great tight writer. You know, he's good at writing a bit that'll hit quickly. And, and, and like you said, some people process, you know, through dark comedy, that's how they process their pain and their emotion, like, a, like Mark Norman or Miss Pat or Bill Burr, you know, there's, there's those people who, oh, hey, Paul, and that's what makes them funny is that, is that torture. Yeah, yeah. there were, there were people that, you know, got bullied when they were kids and they'd have to make them laugh to get out of it. You know, instead of fighting, they made people laugh. Um, that was, I had a little bit of that actually, because I was always a small guy in stature. So, um, you know, <clears throat> you're always going to have a, a bully in school when you're a young kid. And I think I made the classroom laugh and, you know, I would get kicked out of class and my parents would have to come get me and stuff, but it was all just for making people laugh, you know? And, uh, it's funny when the teachers, you know, they reprimand you for that. And then all of a sudden I wonder what they see, you know, when I'm on TV, doing stand-up, you know, or in a club. Uh, wow, this guy really went into this thing, you know? Brian. Hey, Gary, I was wondering, um, who were some of your early comedic influences? And also, are there any um, up-and-coming uh, comedians maybe we haven't heard of that you think maybe uh, maybe might be the next big thing? Um, well, my early influences were Steve Martin, uh, Robert Klein, for sure. Uh, Robert Klein for his uh, observational humor and Steve Martin for his all-out silliness. And also, I loved Andy Kaufman for because right. Andy Kaufman just took it to the the next level. He didn't he didn't care about anything. And I, I kind of do that in my act where I just um, I like walking the tightrope, you know. And if you fall, you fall. But I just love that that excitement, you know. Uh, of doing a bit and having people kind of look at you and then get it kind of thing, you know. Uh, oh, right. Kaufman was just a genius. And uh, obviously Steve Martin, genius. Um, so those guys were like my my early uh, uh, influences. Uh, up-and-comers? I don't know. I'm, I'm working with a, 
a buddy of mine now, um, Will Julian, he's a New York comic. He's been doing it for about 10 years. He's really a smart guy, funny guy, good writer. Uh, we're working on a couple scripts right now. So he's one, you know. I don't know a lot of the young guys because I'm not in the clubs a lot, you know. Right, right. But uh, I'm sure they're out there, man. There's always funny people coming up. <laughs> Steven. Um, yeah, yeah. You were on King of Queens from season two through season nine. A decent time to be on, you know, on a sitcom. It was very, very successful and had great ratings. Uh, when something like that ends as an actor, do you feel uh, more nervous, uh, you know, because you kind of had a gig and now it's done? Or do you feel more excited? I mean, obviously, is history has seen things went well for you and you had other projects. But did you feel more excited to move on to something new or kind of like, ah, what am I going to do next, you know? Yeah, when it ended, I was I crying and went into therapy. Um, <laughs> uh, when it ended, I didn't. Um, it ended in '07, and we felt like the run was long enough. You want to leave them wanting more. Uh, from what I understand, Seinfeld did the same thing. Uh, Everybody loves Raymond did the same thing. We were all about nine years, so. Um, you know, could we have squeezed another year or two out of them? Yeah, we probably could. But we went out, I think, at the right time. Uh, the only thing is, in 07, there was a writer strike. So oh, I couldn't yeah. jump into something else. You know, nobody could jump into something else. Yeah. Uh, so that was a little weird, you know. I thought, I'll go from this to another. And, you know, all I knew was really the success of this show, you know. And here we are now in a writer strike. What are you talking about, you know? Uh, so there was a couple of years there that were a little down, but nothing, nothing horrible, you know. Uh, I think the streaming revolutions changed that so much, right? For actors, oh, yeah. you, know, you know. Yeah, definitely. The streaming uh, has definitely changed it. Um, there's some good and some bad with that too, you know. There's a lot of avenues now, like so many avenues now to put a show on. Uh, of course, the money's not the same you know, as it was back then when you had the four networks uh, and a couple of cable stations, you know. But uh, it's all good. I mean, I, I love the fact that you, you can go to, uh, uh, you know, IFC or any of these, True TV, and do do some shows. And, you know, it's great. I think it's, I think it's fantastic. So, well, and, and, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say the amount of projects that are getting made now, even like a Fargo series, um, or, you know, some things that maybe whenever the four networks were in control wouldn't have gotten past that process, you know, because of the streaming change, now kind of get a chance that we get to see that. And there's things like Squid Games or things that people never really thought they would have liked or would have made it onto that, you know. So it's kind of maybe the money has suffered, but I feel like the content has gotten better as far as, uh, you know, quality goes, right? Yeah, you know, um, with the streaming and all these different outlets, it, it, you get a more of a chance to get a show off the ground. You know, they don't give you three episodes and then, you know, yank it off the air. They actually give you uh, some breathing room, you know, to do your thing. So that's a nice thing. That's a, that's a really nice thing because, look, uh, a show like uh, any show is, is a little rough in the beginning. You know, the characters have to gel. The writers have to gel with the characters. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Uh, you know, Seinfeld, they ordered four episodes in the beginning of that show. And it wasn't very good, you know. And thankfully, look, I mean, look, look what it did. But uh, I think we had maybe, I think in the beginning we had 13 episodes and then we went to 22 thereafter for the rest of the run. But sometimes 24, they would add a couple. Uh, but yeah, I think with all the different media outlets now gives you a little breathing room. Um, Cheers finished like 76 out of 78 shows its first season. So you just never know what's going to take off. But uh, all right. so we'll, we'll get you out of here with this tonight. Um, tell us about, you got a Netflix movie coming out January 28th. Uh, that's a Friday. So tell us about your new movie, Home Team. Yeah, this was kind of neat. Uh, it's a story about Sean Payton, the coach of the New Orleans Saints. And, um, uh, there was a year that he was uh, kicked out of the NFL for, you know, 
bounty hunting kind of thing, you know. Bounty gate. Yep. Bounty gate. And um, it's a story about he goes back and helps coach his 13-year-old son's football team with uh, Taylor Lautner as the head coach, and I'm the assistant coach. Uh, I play coach Mitch Bazoin, uh, who's kind of a goofy character, and um, he has a, a little bit of a drinking problem, so he rides his bike to the field, and he tells the kids it's for uh, <laughs> it's to get in shape, but they all they're all on to him, and they they know what it's all about. Um, so it's fun. It was a great movie, but he Kev Kev plays Sean Payton, Taylor Lautner, like I said. Uh, plays the head coach, and I play the assistant coach. And it's really a story about uh, Sean Payton. He's so busy in the NFL for so many years. He's just been a football coach. That's all he's known. You know, he went through a divorce, wasn't really close with his son, Connor. And this really brings them together when he goes to coach him. And it's it's kind of a love story between, you know, the father and his son. Really nice. Sounds it's like a feel good film. Good film. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. I'm look, you said uh, Friday the 28th, correct? Yeah, it's got a little uh, Bad News Bears feel to it, uh, you know, but it's a feel-good movie, yes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Gary Valentine, for joining us. That, that was fun. Uh, I want to remind everybody, hit that subscribe button as well. Um, get those numbers up on, on whatever platform you're listening to. I know we're on like 15 platforms now, so whatever platform it is, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And thank you again, Gary, for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for having sure. me. Everyone have a great night. We'll see you next time.